Does it have to be a military strike? Could it be cyber weapons? We will respond at our time, at our way, in the way we choose to do. Those are the words that have the world on edge tonight, wondering what kind of counterattack Israel will launch against Iran. And that could happen at any moment. I'm Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. It has been another tense day in the Middle East, with Iran saying it is preparing its air defenses and Israeli leaders drawing up attack plans to respond to the Iranian drone and missile barrage that they intercepted over the weekend. The IDF saying today that Iran will pay and showing just one of the over 100 massive ballistic missiles which were shot down before they could reach their targets. This right here. It's about 36 feet long, and that's without the missing engine or the warhead, which weighs more than 1,000 pounds. It was shot down uh, probably just outside airspace of Israel, uh, and it fell actually in the Dead Sea, uh, where we retrieved it from, and uh, now we're studying it in order to understand its weaknesses, its strengths, why it uh, separated the way it did, uh, so that we can be better prepared for the next time they try and do something like this. Meanwhile, the U.S. is now saying that despite their best efforts to try to de-escalate things, Israel will ultimately decide what they want to do. We have been very clear in our concerns that this war not escalate. I have to say that Israel, Israel's war cabinet will make the decision about what Israel will do. Now, Iran has repeatedly said they have no intention of continuing these strikes and that their attack has, quote, concluded and was self-defense after an Israeli strike on the Iranian embassy in Damascus. All of this playing out as Israel continues to fight Hamas and displace over a million Palestinians in Gaza in a conflict that's been going on now for over six months. NBC foreign correspondent Matt Bradley has more from Beirut. So the conflict between Israel and Hamas and the Gaza Strip has now been going on for well more than the past six months and seen immense casualties, particularly on the Palestinian side, where more than 30,000 Palestinians have been killed in the Gaza Strip, according to the Gazan health authorities, most of them civilians. But now we're at something of an impasse. Iran has attacked Israel with a volley of missiles numbering more than 300, including drones. 99% of those, according to the Israelis, were shot down. And there was only one injury, a young girl in Israel, a Bedouin girl. Uh, there were no deaths. This is an opportune moment for all sides of this conflict to step back from the brink and just save face and try to move toward peace. But instead, we are hearing from the Israelis that they are planning some sort of reprisal, some sort of counterattack. And while we don't know the details, the details wouldn't be revealed. Only a little bit of information has been given to NBC News that the Israelis may be planning to attack not Iran itself, where those volley of missiles were first launched, but actually some of the Iranian proxies throughout the region, going back to the way this Cold War has been fought between Iran and Israel for the past several decades, through proxy groups, through smaller groups, sort of irregular armies that have been fighting against the Israelis along their borders. One of those is Hezbollah here in Lebanon, way to the south from where I am now, right along the Israeli border. Now, if the Israelis decided to target Hezbollah, and they have been doing so for the past six months, that could escalate the war uh, considerably and could drag in the entire region. Now, again, this is a moment when the Israelis and the Iranians could step back from the brink and again, they would be able to kind of appease their domestic polities who are all demanding that they take aggressive action while still not escalating this fight. So in the next several days, we'll see exactly where this entire region is headed. But there are a lot of fears here. This could erupt into a region wide war. Matt Bradley, thanks so much. Meanwhile, over in Washington, House Speaker Mike Johnson is trying to pass a funding bill to send aid to Israel. And this time he is trying to get it passed separate from aid to Ukraine and Taiwan. And all this is happening as House Republicans are trying to impeach Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas, while some far-right Republicans are threatening the Speaker's job yet again. NBC's Ryan Nobles has more. Tonight, a trial in the Senate set to begin 
with House Republicans formally sending over articles of impeachment against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. The Senate has a clear obligation under the Constitution and 200 years of precedent. We need to hold a trial. Republicans accusing him of willfully refusing to comply with immigration laws with a record 9.3 million migrant border crossings since President Biden took office. Mayorkas and Democrats call the charges baseless. Senate Democrats poised to quickly dismiss them. All of it as drama also builds back in the House, with Speaker Mike Johnson preparing to defy his most conservative House colleagues and call votes on a series of aid packages for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. This despite running the risk conservatives may attempt to boot him from the speakership through what's called a motion to vacate. Johnson defiant. It is in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion when we are simply here trying to do our jobs. It's the same threat that allowed a small number of Republicans joining with all Democrats to take out former Speaker Kevin McCarthy last year. It's going to happen. Though only a small group of Republicans seem open to another round of Speaker drama. And some Democrats have suggested that this time they are willing to help save a Republican Speaker. And I have the ability to table that, which would be to pour water instead of gasoline on this place, yeah, then of course that's what I'm going to do. Meanwhile, tonight, Johnson's path to pass that foreign aid package is far from perfect. He wants to call separate votes. The bills would have to go back to the Democratic Senate, where there is no guarantee they would pass. Meanwhile, national security leaders in the House are imploring their colleagues to pass Ukraine aid this week, saying a classified briefing today revealed the need there is critical. Thanks, Ryan. In Manhattan, to the surprise of a lot of people, all of a sudden, lawyers seem to be quickly putting together a jury of everyday New Yorkers that will decide whether former President Donald Trump is guilty or innocent in that porn star hush money case. Now, today, seven jurors officially made the cut after both sides were unable to agree on any jurors yesterday. But they still need 11 to go for those 12 jurors and those six alternates. And as for Trump, it is another day. He has made it very clear he does not want to be there, while the judge has made it very clear that he needs to follow all instructions. At one point, coming down hard on the former president when Trump muttered something with an earshot of a potential juror, saying, I will not have any jurors intimidated in this courtroom. I want to make that crystal clear. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Lisa Rubin. Uh, Lisa, so let's start with these seven that made the cut here. What do we know about them? Well, we know a lot about them, Gotti, and I want to be judicious in talking about them because Manhattan is a small island and nothing brings that closer to home than watching jury selection and realizing that many of these people could be your friends and neighbors. Some of them have employers where you have worked before. I will tell you that there is a juror, for example, who's worked at an employer that's very familiar to me personally. And so I want to be careful. But we know that they live all across the island of Manhattan from Harlem to the Lower East Side. We know that they have jobs that range from sales to oncology nursing and to a big firm lawyer. We know that many of them are married, some are not, some have children, some don't. But the most important thing that these folks share in common is that none of them are really political outliers. And none of them, despite whatever their inclinations are about former President Trump or what political party that they belong to, none of them answered questions in a way that either side had concern about there being partisan loyalties here. These are not people who are regular rally attenders or donors or people who follow former President Trump's every word on Truth Social. They're really more like everyday New Yorkers, and some of them are even people that would self-describe themselves as apolitical or not all that into the news. Interesting. I mean, meanwhile, let's take a quick listen to what Trump said as soon as he walked out today, because that's getting some headlines as well. We think we have a very conflicted, highly conflicted judge. He shouldn't be on the case, and he's rushing this trial. Uh, okay, so Lisa, I can't remember ever seeing a suspect walk out in front of the courthouse, bash the case, bash the judge on the case uh, before the trial even starts. If this was anybody but Trump, what would normally happen at this point? 
Well, that's an interesting question. Let's start with the fact that nobody other than Trump would be allowed to hold court in the courthouse the way that he hmm. does. You know, we have a pen of hallway pool press, for example. I'm hard pressed to think of a time that a defendant got to use the hallways of a courthouse the way that former President Trump has, as if it's his personal briefing room, so to speak. So let's start there. But secondly, with respect to the stuff that he's saying about a judge, look, the stuff he's saying about Judge Mershon is expressly not covered by the gag order, which doesn't cover the judge himself. So in some respects, Trump is venting in the only way that might be permissible here. Lots of the other ways in which he might vent would be covered by the gag order and would be sure to be sanctioned. On the other hand, in all of the cases where he's faced gag orders thus far, the judge are always exempt from them because they believe that they take on a risk in taking on these jobs and that it's not their responsibility or even something that they can do. It's not even permissive to protect themselves in that way from a defendant's speech. So, yes, it's unusual, but still permissible. Holding court in court. Uh, you said it perfectly there. Uh, <laughs> back to the jury selection. Uh, Arvon Hilliard got a chance to chat with someone who was dismissed. It seems like such a surreal experience for anybody. So he asked them what it was like for them, and here's what they said. I can be fair and impartial. You get the sense that it's like, oh, this is just another guy. Not only is, is someone's fate kind of in our hands here, but the fate of parts of our country's legal system going forward is kind of in our hands because this is unprecedented. All right, so she seems like a, a nice woman. She said, yeah, I can be impartial. Um, but what are the kinds of things that are getting people disqualified for this case? Well, so there are two ways you get disqualified. One is through something called a peremptory challenge, which is either side can strike jurors, they up to 10 of them, for any reason. And so, in some respects, we don't know exactly what's getting people struck, but the other reason people are getting struck is for cause, for having bias. And in two cases today, former President Trump's lawyers successfully struck two jurors for cause because of social media posts that they found. Remember, they have the names of these prospective jurors, even though we as the public do not. And that affords any defendant who has the resources to hire jury experts or consultants and has the time to turn over these names the opportunity to find, have these people said things in their social media posts that are not only reflective of real bias against former President Trump, but are also at odds with representations that they made to the court. That's what they found today. Someone who said, get him out and lock him up, for example, was one of the jurors struck. Oh, okay, time out. We just had a graphic up, and I was reading that. If we could pull it back up. There were two at the top that caught my eye. Texas relatives like Trump, and then <laughs> dog at home? Can you walk us through what those are about? Yeah, so like the dog at home is somebody who basically says, I'm unable to serve or I'm unable to stay uh, late on some days because I have caregiving responsibilities. It just so happens that the person they're caring for is their dog. The <laughs> Texas Republican relatives, I, I know who this is. This is a, a juror that basically said, look, there are a lot of people in my life who are partial to former President Trump, both because of what I do for a living, I'm in the financial space, but also mm. because I'm from Texas. There are lots of people in my life who like this guy and I I could be victim to my own implicit bias about that. I feel a need to confess that to you. That guy was excused, too. Interesting stuff. Lisa, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And turning now to another case that could have huge implications for former President Donald Trump. This one's at the Supreme Court, and it's actually not about Trump specifically, but could play a big role in his legal future. This case is about this guy, Joseph Fisher, a former cop from Pennsylvania who was at the Capitol on January 6th. Now, Fisher is trying to dismiss a charge against him that alleges obstruction of a pro official proceeding. But here's why that's important. Here's what it has to do with Trump. That specific charge is one of the same ones in the federal election interference case against Trump. So if Fisher is able to get that charge tossed out, there's a chance Trump's charge might also get tossed out as well. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, talk to us about this case. What is the police officer's argument here? And do we have any indication of what the Supreme Court justices are, are thinking here? Sure we do, from oral argument. Uh, let's take a listen, for example, to Justice Gorsuch uh, as he questioned one of the litigants. Would a sit-in that disrupts a trial 
or access to a federal courthouse qualify? Would a heckler in today's audience qualify or at the State of the Union address? Would pulling a fire alarm uh, um, before a vote qualify for 20 years in federal prison? Let me give a little background here. This case really boils down to two interpretations of a witness, or excuse me, an evidence tampering statute. Is it an ev purely an evidence tampering statute? Is it about taking documents and hiding them to obstruct a congressional proceeding? Or is it much more broad? Is it anything done that obstructs any proceeding irrespective of documents or evidence or anything like that. And that's what Justice Gorsuch is suggesting, that how far do we take this? Is it a situation where, well, any obstruction of any proceeding, one example given was a heckler in the gallery of the Supreme Court, which happens. I've been in courtrooms where hecklers disrupt proceedings. Is that obstructing a, an official proceeding? So the real question is, how broadly should this statute be interpreted? Is it about documents or is it anything? that obstructs, slows down, or impedes any official proceeding. And Gorsuch there was giving some examples. Interesting. Let's zoom out a little bit to talk about the charge specifically. Why is it so controversial, and, and, and why could this have a ripple effect across all of the January 6th cases that we've seen, including some of the ones that have been adjudicated? It wouldn't affect all the January 6 cases. That's because only a fraction have been charged with this particular statute, 1512C2. And the justices, some of the conservative justices actually pointed out that never in history has the government brought these charges in connection with a violent act like we saw on January 6. And this is something that essentially the uh, Solicitor General had to sort of concede, although she said it has been brought in non-documents cases. But yeah, this is a relatively new application of this particular statute. So in this sense, it's a case of first impression, and it could affect Trump because he's charged with similar crimes. But it really wouldn't have a gigantic ripple effect on January 6th defendants, but it certainly would affect the ones that have been charged with this particular statute. And the Solicitor General said, well, no, we only charged the people that we thought had that corrupt intent to obstruct a proceeding. And that was a narrow, narrower class of people. Danny, while we have you, I'm turning back to the criminal trial in New York next week, I know the judge is going to hear arguments about whether Trump violated uh, that gag order. What could we expect there? Yeah, I suspect the judge pushed this off for a couple different reasons. Number one, he probably thought that by next week we might have more gag order violations and why not just consolidate them? <laughs> uh, the other reason is, and we may never know for sure, is simply on Monday morning, the judge wanted to get to jury selection. He's probably thinking, I've got hundreds of people in that next room. We've been arguing over all kinds of miscellaneous motions. We need to get to jury selection. I'm tabling this. We'll deal with it next week. He hasn't given any indication as to which way he'll go, and that's the right thing to do is not forecast it. But I imagine he might have more instances by next week and just group them all together. A lot more to come. Danny Savalos, thanks. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. Still ahead, tornadoes tore through the country last night. And tonight, millions of people are under severe weather alerts. Bill Karens has the details as we keep an eye on those conditions. Plus, USC's valedictorian says the school pulled the plug on her commencement speech because of her pro-Palestinian beliefs. NBC's Liz Kreutz will be here to get into this with us. And up next, Tom Costello sits down for an exclusive interview with a whistleblower who has some shocking allegations against Boeing. That's coming up straight ahead, so stay tuned. As far as I'm concerned, right now needs and attention. And the attention is you need to check your gaps, make sure that you don't have potential for premature failing. Hey there, welcome back. NBC's Tom Costello has a fascinating and exclusive interview with the whistleblower at Boeing. We're going to get into that in just a bit, but first, here's some other headlines we're watching tonight. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas was back on the bench after an unexplained one-day abstinence. He, he returned today as the court heard arguments in that case about the January 6th riots at the Capitol. Thomas has ignored calls to recuse himself from cases involving January 6th because his wife attended a Trump Stop the Steal rally near the White House earlier that day before violence uh, broke out. 
And an 81-year-old Ohio man has been charged with murder in the shooting of an Uber driver he thought was working with a scammer. The suspect had gotten a scam call, around, and the same person who called him then requested an Uber ride to his house, demanding the man hand over a ransom. Uh, some money there. The man thought the Uber driver was in on it and shot her three times. Police say she never threatened the man and didn't even have a weapon on her. And Uber says their hearts are with the family and they are supporting police with their investigation. And a Tennessee judge heard arguments over whether the Covenant School Shooters Manifesto should be made public. Last year, a shooter killed three kids and three adults at the Christian Elementary School in Nashville. Today's hearings focused on the state's public record exemptions. And last month, this piece of metal that you're looking at right there, that's the one. It tore through the roof and two floors of a Florida house. Now NASA is confirming, yes, that hunk of junk is indeed a part of the space station cargo pallet. NASA is planning to investigate how that thing survived the fiery trip through the atmosphere. And last night's baseball teams across the MLB wore the number 42 to celebrate the 77th anniversary of Jackie Robinson breaking the sports color barrier. Members of Robinson's family, including his 101-year-old widow, Rachel, were at ballparks from coast to coast to honor him. And now to that exclusive NBC News reporting tonight, we are hearing from a Boeing whistleblower who claims that widely used 787 Dreamliner could break apart midair because of a production flaw. Boeing is strongly pushing back, saying the claims are without merit, but the Boeing engineer at the center of these claims will tell his story to Congress tomorrow. And here's what we heard him tell NBC News' senior correspondent Tom Costello today. Boeing 787 Dreamliner has been flying since 2011, made of a lightweight composite material and stronger than a typical aluminum fuselage. But a current Boeing quality engineer has told the FAA he believes the plane has a potentially fatal flaw. I think it's as serious as I have ever seen in my lifetime. 15-year Boeing veteran Sam Salapur will tell Congress Wednesday that the gaps between big pieces of the fuselage are too big. And even though they're fastened together, the stress could create fatigue failure in the fuselage after thousands of flights. What would happen if you had a fatigue failure in a 787 at altitude? The plane will fall apart at the joints where the, we're talking about. Once you fall apart, you're going to descend all the way to the ground. You think the plane could literally break apart in air? Absolutely. But Boeing tells NBC News we are fully confident in the 787 Dreamliner because of the comprehensive work done to ensure the quality and long-term safety of the aircraft. These claims about the structural integrity of the 787 are inaccurate. These issues do not present any safety concerns. In 2020, Boeing worked with the FAA to tighten paper-thin gaps, pausing plane deliveries for two years, stress testing the plane to 165,000 takeoffs and landings, more than three times a typical 787's lifespan, and inspecting 689 planes already in service. Boeing says it found zero evidence of fatigue. Even if these cracks would form, which there's no evidence of, the airplane is so resistant and so structurally robust, according to Boeing, that they're not going to break apart. Salapur was moved from the 787 project in 2022, he claims, in retaliation for raising these concerns internally. Boeing insists retaliation is strictly prohibited. Salapur admits he does not have access to all of Boeing's test data. Still, with 1,100 planes in service, he'll tell Congress the 787 should not be flying. Should Boeing ground the 787 right now to check the gap sizes? I would say they need to. The entire fleet worldwide? The entire fleet worldwide, as far as I'm concerned right now, needs an attention. On Monday, Boeing gave reporters a detailed briefing on its extensive stress tests, its reputation on the line after two fatal MAX 8 crashes overseas, and the MAX 9 door plug blowout in January, the subject of Wednesday's congressional hearing. Salapur's attorney says she's heard from more than half a dozen other potential whistleblowers with similar concerns. Have any of those whistleblowers agreed to come forward yet? Not yet. I think some of them will come forward, but frankly, they're terrified. I'm at peace with myself because this is going to save a lot of people's lives. That's what's at stake. That's what's at stake. Many more questions to come tomorrow. Tom, thank you for that.
Now, after that fiasco with Taylor Swift tickets, it seems like Live Nation might not be shaking off their problems anytime soon. The DOJ is getting ready to slap Live Nation with an antitrust lawsuit. Live Nation is Ticketmaster's parent company, and they came under scrutiny this past November after Taylor Swift fans were blocked from the site during a crash, stopping them from buying tickets to the Eras Tour. So what could this lawsuit mean? NBC's Brian Chung has more. Hey, Gotti, well, it seems like the government doesn't want those tears from those Taylor Swift fans to go for naught, and that's because there's new reporting from the Wall Street Journal that says there could be an antitrust lawsuit that the government will lodge against Live Nation and Ticketmaster as soon as next month. Now, again, this is reported by the Wall Street Journal, so we don't have the, the, the details over what this antitrust case could involve. But broadly speaking, it sounds like the allegations will be that Ticketmaster and Live Nation are using their massive scale within the ticket industry to bully out the competition. Now, uh, we do know that Ticketmaster and Live Nation account for about 80 percent of primary ticket sales in this country. And that's a big deal for a lot of these large artists like Taylor Swift that in many cases will sell their tickets through a platform like Ticketmaster. Now, uh, the question here is, how is the DOJ going to put together uh, that argument? We do know that there are uh, defenses coming from Live Nation and Ticketmaster itself, and they contend that, well, it's not us that sets prices, it's the venue and also the artist that sets prices. But then you have antitrust advocates that are saying, well, if they have 80 percent of the market, how do we know that they're not trying to do their best and, and give a good faith effort to give the consumer the best possible experience when buying these tickets at the best available price? And the Eras Tour is one example of how uh, a lot of fans were turned off by uh, having to go to Ticketmaster where the ticket prices were, uh, in their view, exorbitant. And in many cases, they also experience technical glitches. The experience is also part of this when it comes to buying tickets. So this has been a big focus of the Biden administration. And at the end of last year, we had even seen the Federal Trade Commission under uh, Biden appointed uh, chair Lena Khan try to implement uh junk fee changes. And, and one example of this would be uh, a proposed rule at the end of last year that proposes requiring these types of companies, not just Ticketmaster, but broadly speaking, other types of companies as well, to fully describe the all-in price that includes fees and describes whether or not they're refundable. But again, this is something that could be very slow. We still have yet to see the details of this potential antitrust suit, but we'll have to see in the months to come, Gotti. Meanwhile, tonight, there is a dangerous tornado watch stretching across the Midwest and the Great Plains. Tornadoes have been touching down all throughout the day, and there have been warnings through Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri, Kansas. Check out the damage that one tornado caused in Missouri. Several buildings with roofs, uh, roofs ripped off there, and it's not just tornadoes. We are seeing large hail. The size of golf balls and damaging winds are also this huge risk right now. 25 million people are in the path of these storms tonight as it's making its way east. And NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens joining us now. Bill, we've seen several reported tornadoes over the last 24 hours. What are conditions looking like right now? Yeah, we are at the tail end of this tornado outbreak. Uh, we've been in the heat of it for like eight straight hours. Um, in all, the worst of it has been in areas of Iowa, and that's where we're going to start here. We still have some active severe thunderstorm warnings. In the Davenport area, you were under a tornado warning, then a severe thunderstorm warning, and now another line of storms is about to come through. So, yeah, you've been uh, you know, hunkered inside and waiting for these storms to pass for a while now. Madison, Wisconsin's got some storms. We're keeping an eye in Chicago. You have an isolated chance of a storm or through too, but for the most part, the severe weather is out here to your west. Here's a closer zoomed in view of these storms. Large hail and damaging wind is the threat now. The tornado threat has passed for the Davenport area. In all, about 16 tornadoes reported today. Numerous reports of you know dozens of high wind and large hail. Northern Missouri and Iowa have been the hardest hit early today, though. We did see a couple tornadoes in areas of Kansas. So here's what's left of our tornado watches, and these will be expiring as we go throughout the next hour or two. We'll wait and see if they issue any new watches for the Chicago area. As we lose the daylight heating, that's when things are going to start to calm down at least a little bit. And then tomorrow, this same storm is going to be responsible for additional strong storms, maybe even a few tornadoes. And we're heading towards some big population centers, Detroit, Cleveland, Toledo, Columbus, and Fort Wayne included in this. That's why we got 17 million people in this slight risk. And, you know, even if we don't get the tornadoes, we're going to get some wind damage and some hail out of that. By the time we get to Wednesday evening, we're just about seeing that line of storms all the way to the Pennsylvania 
Pennsylvania, Ohio border. So this will be during the middle of the afternoon. And then by about this time tomorrow, it should be winding down and ending. Then just kind of rainy weather on Thursday in areas of the northeast. And then another severe weather threat in areas of St. Louis. So, God, it's been a dangerous day. We've had damage and a lot of people, uh, you know, have lost their homes. Uh, but we have, thankfully have not yet had any reports of any really serious injuries or fatalities. So we'll take that. Several linings there. Bill, thanks. And coming up, convicted murderer Scott Peterson was back in court today hoping to get his conviction overturned more than 20 years after the death of his wife and unborn child. We've got those details, but first, you got to see this. A California man has a pretty big project on his hands renovating this massive ship. Christopher Wilson is restoring that classic cruise ship back to its former glory. The Aurora launched back in 1955 over in Germany and was, at the time, one of the most luxurious cruise ships. And it changed owners a bunch, but Wilson is giving it some much-needed TLC. He actually got that ship from a Craigslist posting back in 2008, but is still working on renovations. And that is a renovation show I would love to watch. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. There is a big controversy brewing here in L.A. over the decision to cancel a valedictorian speech at USC. We're going to get to that in just a second. But first, here's some other headlines that we're watching out in the West. The Supreme Court has decided that Idaho can ban gender-affirming care for minors. It is the first time the justices have ruled on the divisive issue of transgender health treatments. Uh, Idaho can now join almost half the country where similar bans have also been passed. And Scott Peterson, who is serving a life sentence for killing his wife and unborn child more than 20 years ago was back in court today. He's hoping for a new trial after the L.A. Innocence Project took up his case. Now, his defense team withdrew a motion to have some of the witnesses in the case sealed from public. He'll be back in court next month for a motion about DNA evidence testing. And a former U.S. Marine with neo-Nazi ties was sentenced to nine years in prison. He and one other man firebombed a Planned Parenthood clinic in California two years ago. The judge said he committed an act of, quote, domestic terrorism while he was stationed at Camp Pendleton. 5,000 miles away from the fighting and the bombing in Gaza, tensions from the war are causing controversy right here in Southern California. Today, USC announced it is canceling its valedictorian speech at graduation over what they are calling, quote, security concerns. Fourth year, Asna Tabassum was originally picked to be valedictorian, but since then, the first generation Muslim American has come under fire for posts on social media. And the university says their decision to cancel the address isn't really about Asna per se, but they're worried about safety on campus and possible disruptions. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz joins us now. Liz, so no speech at all now here. Uh, what's going on? Yeah, it's complicated for sure, Gotti. So basically what happened was about a week ago, the university announced their tradition of who their valedictorian is. This is this young woman who was chosen out of about 100 students that qualified and then applied to be valedictorian. The university provost chose her. But then as students started looking into her, some Jewish students, some pro-Israel groups started raising concerns with the university because they say that some of her social media posts are anti-Semitic, they're pro-Palestinian. What it is right now that we can see when you go on her Instagram, it's private, but in her bio, she has a link to a pro-Palestinian slideshow and in it, there's calls for the abolishment of Israel. These students, the Jewish students, say that this makes them feel unsafe, unwelcome at a time when they already feel unsafe on campus. They feel like the valedictorian should be representative of all the students. So they raise these concerns, and the university then has come out and said, OK, we are going to cancel the speech. We're not going to have her speak. The first time they've ever done this for a valedictorian. But they're not actually saying it's because of that. They're saying it's really because of safety concerns. Um, and they say it's nothing to do with free speech. It's all about making sure they can keep it safe. 65,000 people, roughly, will be attending this graduation. It seems like this kind of backfired on the university, them trying not to or stay out of politics. Right. And now, all of a sudden, this has become a an international political issue right there at USC. Yeah, I mean, there's really no way that universities can stay out of politics right now, right? It's like the heart, 
beat of campuses is this issue about what's happening overseas in Israel and Gaza, and now it's right here at USC. And I think uh, they're trying to sort of tiptoe lightly around it by saying it's about really keeping everybody safe. But you're already seeing demonstrations on campus today. Um, you're seeing there's a, a petition going around to try to get her reinstated as the speaker. And so it's caused a lot of controversy and debate about what is free speech? What is the role of the valedictorian? Is this, you know, what's appropriate? It's, it's complicated, Gotti. We've seen activists on, on all sides of this, but yeah. when it comes to the student body at USC, what's the, what's the main reaction? So I talked to a lot of different students today. I was there on campus, um, and you have a lot of students that are really upset about this. As I mentioned, some are demonstrating, some are now signing a petition. A lot of them feel upset with the university for how they've handled this, saying, like, you're able to keep presidents safe that come and speak at USC, and now you're saying there's a concern about a valedictorian speaking. And she released a statement, we should say, where she says she's profoundly disappointed that the university is succumbing to a campaign of hate meant to silence my voice. And she said that I am not aware of any specific threats against me or the university. So that is something that students have said. USC is not coming out and giving any legitimate, you know, description of what these potential threats are. That said, Gaudi, I also went to the Hillel Center um, and it was talks to some students there, some of the Jewish students who talk about how they weren't even comfortable going on camera because they feel so targeted, so unsafe, the comments they're getting as well. Um, so it, it's a difficult time, I think, for a lot of students. And, and it has, I mean, I've been seeing online people making threats, kind of open threats against her. Does she have any protection from the university? That's a good question. Um, we tried to reach her today. We've just seen her statement. Um, and I think we'll just see how this continues to play out. It sounds like it kind of was pretty sudden for her, is what she says in her in her long statement, uh, that essentially they didn't, they just decided, okay, you're not speaking, and they didn't really have a conversation with her, allow her to address those concerns. I think there's still more to come yeah, in the coming days Yeah, a lot more to come. Yeah. Liz Kreutz, thanks so much. Yeah. Over in Hawaii, the Maui Fire Department has just dropped a report looking into the response of that deadly wildfire that ripped through the island about eight months ago. And that fire killed roughly 100 people, ruined Lahaina, destroyed much of its history, and left thousands of people homeless. But today's report didn't answer some important questions, like what caused the fire and whose fault it is. But Maui Fire says it really wasn't supposed to. NBC's correspondent Steve Patterson joins us now. Steve, uh, a lot of unanswered questions here. A lot of people are still homeless. Uh, why didn't those big questions get answered? Uh, and I think that is sort of one of the big headlines is what this report unfortunately didn't say, not necessarily what it did say. And it was, as you mentioned, it was not designed to be an investigation. In fact, that is literally the, the first thing the assistant fire chief says on camera. Here he is in his own words. Listen to this. It is not an investigation. A well-conceived AAR does not point fingers. It does not name names. That's not what we're about. In the fire service, that kind of accusation making doesn't make us better. It only gets in the way of making genuine improvements. So the question then becomes, what, where is the cause? Like, when do we get that information? The ATF is specifically working on that part of the investigation. We may not hear from them for at least the next few months or so. Guys. So what did we get out of this report? Yeah, so this was an AAR report, uh, sort of an after action report, as they call it. It was to really break down the response, the timeline of the response, how well they responded, some things they could work on. In fact, there were 17 specifically things that they listed in this report that they could do better than that. I, I like some of the, the verbiage here, fully stock relief apparatus. It sounds like a, hmm. you know, sort of firefighter jargon. It, it basically just means that they need to uh, work on having the materials on hand to actually combat the fire. There was one story that the chief told about a guy riding his own personal moped into the fire to save people, which wow. is incredible to think about it, but he shouldn't have to do that, right? Mutual aid, important. This is on basically every fire in California where all these agencies work together in concert when the fire is big enough. It saves lives. I can attest to that. And then create a communication plan to evacuate visitors and residents who, of course, speak different languages. Very important when you're dealing with a situation like this. These are the sort of recommendations that are based off of a report like this. Very important internally, but it doesn't really answer questions for residents who are looking to find out, as you said, why did this fire happen? Who's responsible? And Steve, you've spent a lot of time in yeah. Lahaina. What do they need to recover still eight months after that horrible tragedy? I mean, number one is answers. Mm -hmm. I think at this point they are looking for 
specifically the answers to those questions. These are people in, in the hundreds who are now moving away from the island, who are, are living in hotels or situations where they're with other people. They want to get back to a situation where the town is being rebuilt. We are very far away from that. And they want to know why this fire happened and who is responsible. So I think answers are sort of paramount among that. Obviously, supplies, uh, you know, people have been so gracious in donating to folks there. It is such a part of people's lives when they've taken vacations, they've seen Lahaina, they really understand Hawaiian culture. Uh, but really, I mean, they want answers from people who are responsible for what happened. Yeah, I imagine closure seems impossible when yeah. the question of why is still unanswered. That's exactly right. Steve, thanks so much. Thanks. And conservatives and climate change, maybe two things you never thought would come together. But now there is this one young Republican who is hoping to change the way the conservative party sees conservation by addressing it head on. Benji Backer started the American Conservation Coalition back in 2017, and he just has a new book out today addressing climate change from both sides of the aisle. Benji Backer, he's the author of Conservative Environmentalist and the founder and executive chairman of the American Conservation Coalition. He joins us now. Benji, so good to see you. Uh, so let's start with uh, what are they getting wrong, what are they getting wrong game mm. first. Mm. Starting with conservatives. When it comes to climate change, what do you see conservatives just off the mark here? Well, it's great to see you, and thanks for having me on, because it's a big day. I mean, this is the first book that's been written by a conservative that talks about how we can solve environmental challenges and climate change in decades. And so it's a big moment, and I appreciate you sharing it. And conservatives have gotten this wrong since the early 2000s because of how partisan this issue has become. Back in the 80s and the 90s, Republicans led the biggest environmental efforts in this country. But because when Al Gore took this on as an issue that he ran on in 2004, it automatically became branded as a liberal issue. And instead of coming up with our own alternatives as conservatives, we went the other way and started denying the issue existed. I visited the heart of where people are skeptical of climate change in a place of Midland, Texas, uh, when I was writing this book. And I, I, I got to understand firsthand why people are so scared and, and even denying that climate change exists. They're scared that the solutions are going to come to their communities, take their livelihoods away, and leave them behind. But if they feel like they can be part of the solution, they're all in. And I think that that's really what's been missing from the right is that because they haven't pursued their own solutions, they actually have been left behind and it's kind of been this negative feedback loop. In terms of liberals, uh, we know some like to protest mm -hmm. by, um, I don't know, throwing paint on art. Uh, what do you think progressives are, are getting wrong when it comes to messaging of climate change? Well, they're getting a lot wrong, honestly. They're getting it wrong that the world's going to end tomorrow, and, and they're getting it wrong that we need to take drastic action that will basically screw over a decent part of the population and that we're all just going to have to force our way to electric vehicles and renewable energy. The government and, and these kind of top-down policies are not appealing to most people, not just conservatives, but they're not appealing to progressives either. And when you have people blocking traffic and throwing stupid paintings, it doesn't come across as solutions-oriented. It just comes across as alarming and destructive. The environment needs to be about the environment. And each part of this country has a different environment and, and a different community-oriented you know, mindset that we have to tap into. It's not going to be this kind of globalist, uh, hmm. D.C., led effort. And when progressives make it like that, they turn off a whole host of people that need to be a part of the dialogue. Again, this issue was not polarizing like it is today. People are sick of that. And we need to be looking at the solutions that are willing to help people's lives and boost their pocketbooks and increase their quality of life, but also support the environment. And unfortunately, that message has not come from the left side of the aisle. It's interesting because you've traveled the entire country and uh, we have a different environments, different climates all around. Did you find a common ground here for conservatives and uh, liberals to, to meet in? Absolutely. I mean, conservatives and liberals share a lot of the same principles. They want safer communities. They want cleaner communities. They want clean air, clean water. They want cleaner energy sources. They want opportunities to move towards more sustainable technologies. But the main principle that I've found is that people need solutions that lower costs for them, that increase affordability, that are easy to implement. And there are so many examples of that. I drive a plug-in hybrid vehicle. It gets me 60 miles per gallon. That's an amazing technological achievement from where we were a few decades ago. There's nuclear and solar and wind and hydropower projects happening all over the country, geothermal, and even natural gas have been, has been really helpful in uh, having us 
reduce emissions. But again, people want energy that's reliable, affordable, and cheap. It has to work for people's lives. That's the solutions that people want. And it doesn't matter if conservatives are pushing for it or liberals are pushing for it. That's what people want. And with this book, I'm hoping to chart a new course for the environmental movement that returns us to the days where we're actually finding solutions on this critical issue that we truly all share equally. And one thing you've mastered, uh, just knowing you and knowing your work, is the ability to talk to the different uh, perspectives Anyone. that are coming to this. Yeah. So what's your advice to a liberal who mm. wants to talk to a conservative about this? And then what's your advice to a conservative who uh, is talking to a liberal about uh, climate change? Yeah, I mean, a liberal, uh, this, that's a great question, because a, li a liberal person has to realize that a conservative that's denying or skeptical of climate change isn't denying or skeptical because they hate the environment. They have to realize that there's a reason that they're denying or skeptical of it, whether that's misinformation that they've been spoon-fed, or they're scared of the solution, or they feel like they're not part of the solution. Those are really key reasons, and those are all valid reasons, and, and everyone's reasoning is different. So I think understanding that it's not necessarily this, like, visceral, I hate the environment is critical. For someone on the right, they have to realize that most people on the left aren't trying to take their livelihoods away. They might be a little ignorant or they might misunderstand you, but they don't want to take your livelihoods away. And in fact, most people would welcome conservatives at the table. I have been welcomed by so many liberal leaders at the table because they want me there. They genuinely want me there. And conservatives have to understand that not everyone's out to get them and that not everyone's thinking that the Green New Deal needs to be implemented to take conservative livelihoods away. And they assume that, which is wrong. Benji Backer, author thank of you The so Conservative much. Environmentalist. Benji, thanks for being with us, brother. Thanks. And still to come, a high-stakes testimony on Capitol Hill over anti-Semitism. Columbia's university president will have to answer some of the, the very same questions that ended up costing two other Ivy League leaders their jobs. We're going to have the details on that coming up, so stay tuned. Hey, welcome back. After the resignation of two Ivy League presidents, the head of Columbia University is set to testify about anti-Semitism before a House committee. That story is coming up, but first, let's take a quick look around the world. Heavy rains and flooding have brought Dubai to a virtual standstill. Now, the widespread flooding has canceled flights and closed schools. Rain is unusual in the United Arab Emirates, though it does happen from time to time. But since they're not equipped for this kind of weather, a lot of parts of the country do not have sufficient drainage to deal with all that rainfall. And a fixture of the Copenhagen skyline has gone up in flames. Now, this is an old stock exchange building that partly collapsed because of a massive fire today. Uh, amazingly, no one was hurt, and around 200 people involved uh, were putting out that fire, and there's still no word on what caused it. And thousands of people have been evacuated in the Russian region near Kazakhstan after a river there overflowed. Local officials are blaming both a massive snow melt combined with frozen ground that doesn't absorb the rain or melting snow. And so far, more than 14,000 homes in that area have been flooded. And although this year's Summer Olympics are in Paris, the flame that will burn at those games has been lit in Greece. The ceremony was part of a choreographed event today meant to highlight the birthplace of the Olympics, and that flame will now start that torch relay on its way to France, culminating in an opening ceremony in Paris on July 26th. And Columbia University's president will be in the hot seat tomorrow. She is set to face questions from Congress after the school became an epicenter for protests stemming from Hamas's attack on Israel. NBC News correspondent Mara Barrett has more. In a new essay published in the Wall Street Journal, Columbia University's president, Manoush Shafiq, talks about the challenges of drawing the line between what speech is and isn't allowed on campus and how enormously difficult it can be. But that the current resurgence of anti-Semitism on university campuses is intolerable regardless. Sounds a little familiar, right? The presidents of the University of Pennsylvania, Harvard, and MIT tried to walk the same line just four months ago in an explosive hearing by the same House committee that Shafiq will be facing. And Dr. Gay, at Harvard, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment, yes or no? It can be, depending on the context. The number four Republican in the House, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, going viral after her questions brought out some of the most damaging testimony. If the speech becomes conduct, it can be harassment, yes. Conduct meaning committing the act of genocide? The 
that speech is not harassment. Within weeks, leaders of both Harvard and UPenn quit after their answers drew intense backlash from politicians, alumni, and donors. The chairwoman for the House Education and Workforce Committee, which is holding the hearing, wrote in a statement back in March that some of the worst cases of anti-Semitic assaults, harassment, and vandalism on campus have happened on the grounds of Columbia University. Trying to address it all, Columbia created a new policy for safe demonstrations, adding a designated space for protests. The university also says it's taken disciplinary action against students in connection with campus events since October 7th. But some say that isn't enough. The Anti-Defamation League giving Columbia a D grade for its efforts in a recent report card. Shai Davidai is an Israeli business professor at Columbia who's been actively speaking out about what he says is Columbia's failure to address anti-Semitism on campus and is critical of Shafiq. She knows what's happening. She's done nothing. Shafiq says she hopes to find common ground for solutions to anti-Semitism, not just to make college campuses safer, but for the sake of democracy. The difference between this hearing and the ones that we saw a few months ago is that Dr. Shafiq has a leg up. She's had months to prepare and actually has already been able to put on the record an answer to the question that her colleagues, the other presidents, had tripped up on. The question of whether or not calling for Jewish genocide goes against university rules. The Columbia website has already updated their stance on this, saying that it does go against the rules and is overall inconsistent with their values. That does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you tomorrow, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.